claims to be a true story, this writer said, I found a note on my doorstep today. Opening it, I was excited to see a riddle. And it read, what dog has legs but cannot run? A tail, it cannot wag. A mouth, but cannot bark. A nose, but cannot smell. And the writer says, I love riddles. Before reading the answer, I sat down with my wife, and we spent a while pondering the possible answers. Eventually, curiosity over came us, and we turned over the note to see the answer. And it read, your dog, I'm really sorry I ran it over. <laughs> I hate riddles. And I guess that was a true story claims to be an angel. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, Isaiah 40, 31. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Waiting upon the Lord. Last week we talked about the birth of the Savior, the humble beginnings that he had on this earth, being born in a stable, being wrapped in torn cloths, and laid in an animal feeding trough. And we talked about how the angels glorified God at his birth. And the announcing to the shepherds, they were simple, humble men. He wasn't announced in, at the at the palace or royalty or the, or, the, or the chief priest or anything like that. But today we're going to see what happened next in Luke chapter 2. That was on Luke chapter 2. And this is what happened next starting in verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, from Matthew Poole's commentary, I have access to a lot of commentaries when I'm preparing a sermon. And he says, in these verses is a record of the virgin's obedience to two laws. One concerning the purification of the woman after childbirth, and the other concerning the presenting of the male child before the Lord. So there were two rules that they had to do. And uh, well, I'll just continue reading it. We have the law concerning purification. That's in Leviticus 12, 1. Um, <clears throat> and the sum was that if a woman had brought forth a male child, she should be unclean. That is to say, ceremoni ceremonially unclean for seven days. And after that, continue in the blood of her purifying 33 days. So 40 days after the birth of Jesus, they came to the temple to do this purification right that was required in Leviticus. And that time, at that time, Joseph and Mary uh, also presented Jesus to the Lord. So there were those two things. They presented him as a child and, and they, and they um, did the purification rites for her as a mother. So in verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. The consolation of Israel, of course, is the coming of the Messiah that those people were anxiously waiting for. Some of them were waiting in different ways. Some of them were waiting casually, and some of them, you know, anxiously, but... Um, People wait for things in a different ways, and some people um, just don't like waiting at all. And I'm one of those, but I'm doing better. <laughs> it all depends on what it is. He was a righteous and he was a devout man. There's three things about him: righteous and devout, which means he did his best to live a, live a 
life pleasing to God. Devout means that he was compliant with the religious rules that were set forth in Leviticus. And the second thing about him, he was waiting for the Messiah, the consolation of Israel. He believed in the promises in Scripture uh, that a Savior would come. Most people, even if they believed, waited with an attitude of, if he comes, okay. If it's not in my lifetime, that's okay too. But Simeon had an anxious, acute waiting, a similar attitude that believers have today, uh, some, that is. And the third thing about him, the Holy Spirit was on him. He had a special anointing like the prophets did. And in verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So he had this guarantee the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would see the Messiah while he was still living. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that if you knew that you would not die until the Lord's return? Can you imagine if you knew that? The older you get, the closer you would be to seeing it. Of course, the older, older, older we get, the closer we'll be to being in God's presence one way or the other. But he had the, the promise that he would see the Lord before he died. Verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. So the Holy Spirit was on him, <coughs> moved him, saying, here comes this baby. This is what you were promised you would see. And so he went in, and it says he took the baby in his arms. Verse 28, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, in verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may not dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, now that I have seen the promised Messiah, I'm ready to go to heaven. I'm ready to leave this world. For my eyes, verse 30, have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people, Israel. So it's interesting that they were strictly Jewish people. He was in the Jewish temple. He was a Jewish prophet. But he said, Revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. So we are the Gentiles that that, that, that would come to. And a light for revelation. In John 1, 4, 5, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness cannot penetrate light. It's impossible. Light penetrates darkness. But you cannot emit a beam of darkness to go into light. It can't be done. It is not possible. Darkness can interfere with light, with, with a shadow, the reason we have nighttime is because the earth is in its own shadow. But the light is still there. The sun is still there. It's just we're in a shadow. But it, it, didn't, it didn't penetrate the light. It just interfered with the light. So that's, you know, but the sun is still there. Light reveals form. If you're in the dark, total dark, and you turn on a flashlight, then you can see a form. Whatever you should, you can, if it's a bed, if it's your chair, if it's whatever it is, light reveals form. You can't, you can't, you can't see the form when you're in the dark. Have you ever been in complete, total darkness? You ever go like to to a cavern or something and turn the lights off and you can't see? Anything you can, you ever been like that? Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? That any can, anything can be that totally dark, but <coughs> um, darkness can't reveal anything, you can't see anything in there. J 
you ever go to one of those fun houses when you walk through those different places and then there's this dark, uh, like, a, like a hallway? You can't see anything. You can feel the sides. And all of a sudden there's like a, a mattress or a springy thing there. And you touch that thing and you wonder, what, what in the world is that? It's terrifying. It's, it's... Well, anyway. And then it talks about the glory of Israel. The glory of Israel would not come right away. Israel had a glory under King Solomon. There was a glory. When Christ comes to set up his kingdom and destroy the forces of darkness, God's promise comes to God's people, Israel, will have a glory time like never before. In Revelation 21, 12, it says, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in verse 33, it says, the child's father and mother, back to Luke, uh, marveled at what was said about him. Now, they had already been told by the angel uh, that he would be great. But here in the temple, this revelation continues from Simeon, the prophet. Verse 34, then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You know, the piercing of a soul is anguish, is, is, is torment. So these prophecies would come true. Some people would be for him, some would be against him, the rising and falling of many. To this day, Jesus is controversial. Some accept him, others would crucify him all over again. In fact, some would crucify us for our faith. And in Luke chapter 2, continuing in verse 36, it says, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She, so this puts her in the year of uh, uh, 84 years of age. And it says she never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. That was for all those years. And during those years while she was fasting and praying, and during those years while Simeon was waiting, there was waiting. They were waiting. All of her life, worship, fasting, and praying. And God blessed her with the gift of prophecy. It doesn't take a big, strong, powerful person to serve God. It just takes all of the person that there is. It takes someone who's all in. And verse 38, coming up to them at that very moment. In other words, the very moment when Simeon took the baby in his arms, the parents were there, the baby was there, Simeon was there. At that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Now, it's not recorded what she said about the child, but she knew immediately who the baby was, and she spoke about it to the people around there. And I think she probably knew some people who consulted with her as a prophet, uh, who believed in the coming of the Messiah. And she spoke about that and said, the Messiah has come, this baby is he. So Simeon and Anna were waiting. They were both prophets. Uh, they were used to uttering messages from God uh, about things that would happen. For three or four hundred years, there had not been any recorded prophets in Israel. It's not comfortable to tell a young mother 
that a sword will pierce her soul. But a prophet has to say what the Holy Spirit gives him to say. I can't imagine anything more piercing to a mother than to stand before a cross and see her son crucified a horrible death, but it's recorded that she was there. She was there. But they were waiting on God. They were waiting. That was the central point, the focus of their lives. They had a, a life of waiting. Some things are worth waiting for. You know, I used to tell teenage boys that I was taking their picture um, that they would spend half of their lives waiting for women. But I quickly added that it's always worth the wait. <laughs> Which is true. And um, I found that to be true. It's amazing what life teaches you. <laughs> Generally, we are people who don't like to wait. Does anybody here really enjoy waiting? No. That's universal. We don't enjoy waiting. In our human weakness, we become impatient. Is there anybody here that was never impatient? No. We're a girl. We all, we all do that. I hate waiting in line. And I think that comes back to where we're in grade school. We were in the same class from first grade on. But my last name was with a W, and they always made us line up alphabetically. So I was at the end of the line and had to wait. Now, if you were waiting for somebody to stick you with a needle, well, maybe that wasn't so bad. But I always had to wait. So I don't like waiting. I don't like being in line. When I was a little kid, I can remember staying awake, trying my best to stay awake all night on Christmas Eve so that the very crack of dawn, I could go to my parents' bedroom, can we get downstairs? Can we open our presents? And I thought if I fell asleep, I might wake up an hour later, you know. <clears throat> One time I, I got a, I got a dish and a wet washcloth and I kept looking in my eyes to stay awake so I'd be awake at the crack of dawn so I could go down with permission and of course my parents had to go down too they had to, I woke them up too but I didn't want to you know I stayed awake all night I couldn't wait I like to eat at a buffet we have two really good buffets down there. one is the gourmet buffet that's a China one, really good stuff in there. And I can always say, Ni hao, my peng yo. That means, how are you, my friend, to the owner. And, uh, and just a few words of Chinese. But they, they, they're patient with me. They, let me. they let me speak to them a little bit. But, and the other one is the prime buffet. Everybody around here knows prime buffet, I think. And uh, those are two really good buffets. But I like the buffets because I don't have to wait. <laughs> Go in, order your drink, get your food, and start hogging everything down. <laughs> but that's why I like, you don't have to wait. Go in, get your food. And I tell people at the store sometimes, if somebody's being impatient, that life is too short to be in a hurry. And they usually agree, and then they hurry away. <laughs> I waited for my bride. Everything was okay as long as I could be with her. Then I went to California. She was in Dubois and I was going to be there for 28 months in school and not see her all that time. That was too far and too long. Four months later we had a spring break. It wasn't in the spring, it was in the summer. But So I went home, got married, took my bride with me. Do you have slide one? With lights up. <laughs> well, it's a little bit washed out in that vision. But now here she comes. I was down there. Right about right about here. Her dad was a real big tall guy. And I thought, here she comes, my bride. I've been waiting. We, we, we dated for three years, from 17 to 20. Three years we waited. 
And I, and, and I don't mind telling you that the wedding night was the first night we waited. Give two, give number two. Yeah. Carter. <laughs> Carter. What a baby face I was back then. <laughs> Carter, the wait is over. Took her to California with me. You don't have slide three, do you? I don't have slide three. Couldn't get that one. The slide three was a picture taken from the back that she had her arm around me. And I was going to see how she's going to hold on me. Well, she's still got a hold on me. She never let go. But we had a good life in California and every place else we've been. But there was a three year wait. The best things come to those who wait. That's not a Bible verse. Some people think it is, but it's not. But it's true. Often it's true. But people are so impatient. You go to the store and you hear them sighing at a checkout because the people's got too much stuff. <sighs> Did you ever hear that? Hope you don't do it, but <laughs> you hear that. <sighs> you see them honk the horn at an intersection. Waiting in an emergency room, a waiting room full of people. Life is full of waiting. We get used to it. It's not going to change. We wait. God is not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry. He created time. He owns time. And his timing is the best. God's timing is perfect. So we want, we want healing, we want church growth, salvation to come to loved ones, we want. Some things only God can do, but we have to wait. We have to be sure that what we want lines up with God's will, that it's what God wants, and that's what really matters. So what do you do? You wait as long as it takes. Amen? Amen. James 1, 4. <clears throat> Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How long do you have to wait? Maybe a more important question is, how long should you wait? The answer is in God's sovereignty. He controls the time. You decide what you do in the time of waiting, but God decides how long you're going to have to wait. You can't do anything about that because he's sovereign. It's his time. He owns it. What you need to know is he's always at work. And sometimes we think we want that particular thing right now, but God knows when it is best for us to have it. Sometimes we have to wait until we come face to face with him in eternity. But God does control the time. Become mature in your waiting on God. I say that again. Become mature in your waiting on God. Be thankful while you wait. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then, be at peace while you wait. That's a hard lesson to learn, but it's true. Be at peace while you wait. Not waiting impatiently, but waiting patiently and peacefully. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. So be grateful, that is, for the blessing even before you see it. Let his peace rule instead of your impatience. Anna and and Simeon are good examples of that. They waited a long, long time. But while they waited, they were prophetic. They were doing things for God. 
And then trust God while you wait. Psalm 46.10, my favorite psalm. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then remember that God is always working. Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works for the good of you. He works for your good. But be patient and wait patiently. And then rejoice in the midst of trials. We all have things we want God to do. Amen? We all do. But more importantly, God has things he wants us to do. Those are the things we need to consider and think about and concentrate on. In other words, keep busy for God while you wait for God to do the things you want him to do. Philippians 4 and 4 to 7, and I'm going to close with this verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Are we good waiters? <laughs> we can be better at it. We can be better at it. Just keep God in the middle of your thoughts. And be patient and be a good waiter. And meanwhile, do what God wants you to do. do instead of all of your effort, your mental energy focused on what you want God to do for you, do what God wants you to do for Him. We want to build the church. God wants us to build the kingdom. Amen. He wants us to build the kingdom. It's not going to build itself, right? We're, we're called to do that. Would you stand with me? I'm done with that one now. And would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you. Grateful hearts, Lord, grateful hearts. And we'll do our best, Lord, to wait patiently. Not to get impatient with people, Lord, but to show that we are patient people and that we are peaceful people. And so that people can say, why are you so calm? And then we have an opening to answer them. It's because we have Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we're going to get to heaven. We're going to see God, the author and the finisher of our faith. We love you today, Lord. We love you. And uh, we ask that you would help us to know how to build the kingdom and to increase this church. Bless all your people, Lord, as we go. Bless your people and keep them safe on New Year's Eve this week. And bring us all back safely next time we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, hey, hold, hold up. We don't anybody leave yet. Hold up. I didn't do it. Don't you saw me do it?